Um, hi, everybody. Good evening. I'm Zach, a bachelor in a third year, a third year in a bachelor design program here. There's a saying in feminist journalism that goes, what do we owe to who? It raises a question, if we're going to produce, design something, who will it benefit, how and in which ways? Gell is a firm that began back in 1968 with Sion Gell in Copenhagen and Aha Studios in San Francisco and New York. Gell prioritizes the development of equitable, healthy, and sustainable cities for all. And I think it really embodies this ideology of what do we owe to who in the design beer, really calculating the impact of their work with different cities and community. Tonight, we have the pleasure of receiving Sophie Kovis from Gell. She is trained in urban design at Arkhus School of Architecture in Denmark, with 13 years of experience working across the globe from Scandinavia, Europe, to Asia, Australia, and the Americas, she bridges her passion for people-centered design across all scales, from public realm strategies to urban transformation and public space design. Prototyping and engagement are central pillars in all of her projects. She strongly believes that without people and process, there is no project. User-oriented design at all scales starts with understanding what people need, want, and care about. Currently, she's a consultant and associate project manager for the future of Stephen Avenue in Calgary, the re redevelopment of North Jassab Lakeshore Drive in Chicago, El Canada Master Plan Development in Monterey, Mexico, among other projects. All projects related to active mobility, placemaking, and neighborhood transformation and development. In 2017 and 18, she was a consultant project manager for the Vancouver Downtown Places for People Initiative. She is from Copenhagen, but currently lives in San Francisco, where she works for Gale Studio Inc. Please welcome her. Thank you, Zach. Um, hi, everyone, and happy happy Friday in these COVID January. Uh, Zach, thank you for the wonderful introduction, and and Ron, you too. Um, that was a great um, way to start this event. Um, so I'm going to share my screen, and since this is a slightly different format and I can't see you, I'm going to try and keep this um engaging and a little bit shorter than than what i might normally do for a lecture because i want to preserve more time for q a um but you're also very welcome to post um questions in the chat as we go along and um and then we can we can look at those when um you know i can take a couple of breaks as we go along um in the lecture do you, you see my screen Yep, looks good. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what we do at Gale um, and our baseline philosophy behind all our project work. And then Mari asked me if if I would uh, be willing to share a little bit about my own background and how uh, my studies and and previous work led me to the work at Gale, and and also share a little bit about the work in Vancouver and also. Um, how, um, if, how work has changed uh, with, with COVID, which not surprisingly, it, it definitely has, both the way we work and the type of projects that, that we do or the approach to the projects that we do has been, been impacted, no doubt. So first, just <clears throat> a, a little bit about me and my background. So as Zach said, I'm trained at Oho School of Architecture, which is, which is a cross-disciplinary um, architecture school in the Danish countryside. Um, it is uh, hosting all disciplines from furniture design and graphic design over to um, city and design and also, um, you know, things like interactive design and, and other kinds of discipline. Um, but but the main thing about that that school and the and the training that I went through um, or the education I went through there was that they basically have the philosophy that design thinking is at the forefront of your education, regardless of which of the disciplines that you choose to to basically venture into as you go into your master's program, and I think this is really <clears throat> critical way of thinking about design and how we approach design and architecture that if you learn design thinking, you are instead of learning, you know, um, good architecture is maybe a way to put it. Um, you, you 
learn to apply that to different types of projects, different scales, and, and essentially can take on different types of design discipline projects um, with having a lens of how to approach design regardless of the scale. And um, that has come in very handy for me and has been part of what led me to getting a job at Gale. So I started School of Architecture in 2001 and um, thought I was going to be a furniture designer and very quickly learned that I was way more interested in the bigger scale and systems thinking and strategic thinking and then coming up with concrete ways of bringing those strategies uh, to life one-to-one. Uh, -one. And a lot of my projects already when I was in school was very big picture thinking with extremely big <laughs> sites that were sometimes 10 by 10 kilometers or more. But all of them had a component of, of eye level delivery of something very concrete. So um, in school, Yang Gale was also one of my personal heroes. And um, when I got the chance to uh, get um, start working for Gale, I jumped at it. Um, before that, I worked three years for a landscape architecture firm and did a lot of detail um, design, um, including playgrounds and schoolyards and, and plant palettes and, and uh, all kinds of plaza and park designs at different scales. Um, so what I brought to Gale that at the time was, was more focused on strategic planning and recommendation than actual detail design and concept design was that lens of, of, um, of thinking the strategies into a concrete design solution that could be taken on by um, you know, a landscape architect or an architect and actually um, carried out. So the firm has actually evolved quite a bit since I started and has started doing a lot more um, concept design and master planning work and more concrete design scopes. So as Zach mentioned, I work on, on different types of projects. I work on master plans and I work on you know, more landscape design. I work on a lot of streetscape projects, but what they all have in common is the, the, the public life lens and, and the research lens um, to inform design and decision making. So I'm sure that a lot of you are doing this as part of your studies. Um, I for sure did that when I was a student, but I also know that uh, as a discipline, this is something that, that sometimes gets lost out in the field um, in design firms. Um, just as a sheer, oftentimes a sheer, you know, um, product of the, the, the quick pays and, and the fees there is to deliver um, the work that we need to deliver. So with that, um, a little bit about uh, Gale. So as Zach said, we're an international team. We have headquarters in three different cities, Copenhagen, New York, and San Francisco. That said, um, we all have been working remote for a couple of years now, less so in the Copenhagen office, but in the US offices. And you can tell that I am in my living room in San Francisco here. Um, what's, what's important to maybe mention with our team is that despite the fact that we're in th those three offices predominantly, we do have people that are trained and educated and come from all over the world in our teams. <clears throat> Excuse me, and we and and uh, that also enables us to to work uh, across the globe and and you know we have people that speak a lot of different languages in house, which which also makes that a lot easier for us. Um, so the three different offices. Um, so. All our work, regardless of the type of work, builds on these, this 40 years of, of research that started with Yan Gale back in the 60s. And we, we, have, we call that the Gale Lens. Um, so the public life, public space studies is really all about the lived experience and understanding um, you know, behaviors and needs and desires 
from an eye level perspective and then bridging that with on-site um, uh, research and, and observations of the physical um, realm and then also uh, using, you know, big data and other types of research that is, that's not necessarily conducted by us, um, but might be from third party um, data collectors. Uh, and then using all of these different scales of data and understanding of a site and, and community to inform uh, recommendations, whether they are strategic or um, specific to to design of a, of a site, such as a street or a park or a plaza. We really work across, you know, a lot of different disciplines and, and mainly, you know, thinking, seeing ourselves as both social scientists, urban designers and system thinkers. We have people in our staff that are from different backgrounds to reflect that, although we are predominantly a, a team of, of designers and architects. And one of the things that you know has has shown um, to that the the lived experience and, and public life focus of our work really creates a lot of great value is around consensus cons consensus building. the The challenge that we have in a lot of a lot of our urban environments today is that you you know the the way that things are planned and designed is sort of siloed out in these different segmented. Uh, ownership areas. Um, and if there is not consensus across those different areas, it might be really difficult to, to reach to any decisions of, of any kinds of change making. Um, but reality is that, um, you know, there is also the potential in really focusing on the lived experience, the hum human experience at eye level, and then using that as, as the bridge uh, between all the different disciplines, because that's the one thing that we have in common across all the silos that this is this is ultimately who we serve. This is the people that have their daily lives out in these um, environments that we create. So at, as a baseline, it's really about bridging design and user experience and, and you know, doing that by understanding the human experience. Oftentimes design um, is done or traditionally has been done looking at a plan and sort of rationally fleshing out how things can flow and move and fit. Uh, but reality is that uh, oftentimes the user experience is eye, at eye level is, is quite different and we end up, you know, hacking our way through these design solutions um, to, to make it more efficient or simple for us to navigate or more usable. Um, we believe that by putting people at the center and putting the live, centering our design work around the lived experience, really measuring what we care about, a lot of other benefits come uh, along with that. Um, we might not be, you know, we're not necessarily ourselves experts in sustainability or sustainable landscape design, but we do know that there are you know, a lot of other components where, you know, our work centers things that are necessary to create good environments. And then there are other experts in the field of design that we work with to bring in some of these other, other aspects. But when we put focus on people, it brings a lot of other positive outcomes alongside with it. So this is the man that it all started with. And, and some of you or all of you might know about Yang Gale. It started in Copenhagen um, with research around, you know, what, what kind of environments made people want to be there and what were the components of that. Yan did studies in Copenhagen. He did studies in, in, in Italy. And he has, you know, over the years, both by himself and with other, you know, people at Gale, um, written a series of, of books that are all centered around what it what does it mean to make create good um, habitats for humans? What makes us tick? What makes us happy? And and by default, also with that, pointing out the things that you know maybe function a little bit less well. Um, at the starting point, or you know, oftentimes a, a critique or questioning that we get through our work is that 
you know, you're like against cars, it's, um, you just want everything to be walkable, bikeable, be like Copenhagen, but that's, that's really not the, the point. The main point is that we need to find, we need to strike a balance, right? So for many, many years, we've been building our cities for cars, we've been building our environments for the vehicle scale and speed. And that has brought along a whole swath of challenges, both economical challenges, environmental challenges, equity challenges, and so forth. And we can see that, you know, the, the more thriving cities that thrive on many different levels uh, are the ones that offer areas at minimum of, of human scale, where you can move around by foot, where you can engage, where you have eye contact. Um, with other people and where the human scale is really, you know, met with the way that that the environments are designed. So the human scale is like common to to us as a species. We are a certain size, we're a certain height approximately. We experience things at eye level within a, a set angle and we have five senses that, um, you know, all has an impact on how we perceive um, a place or an environment. And we walk at this approximately 5K speed, which means that as we walk down the street, we can take in so many uh, stimuli and uh, places that have less stimuli are often places that, that people shy away from, from walking in or being in at all. So just going back to this one, it's not, you know, it's maybe it's like stating the obvious <laughs> that the image that shows the vehicle scale is not necessarily very stimulating walking environment. Um, whereas the other one has a lot of different components that makes that a more interesting and engaging place to be. So we really believe that, you know, small scale means that we'll, we can create an eventful, intense and warm cities where people want to be, where people want to engage with each other, and where you also might meet people that you otherwise wouldn't meet if you were just, you know, in your home, in your car, at your workplace, and then, you know, reverse. So I think from our perspective, quality public realm also plays a role, um, you know, as a democratic exchange space it's a it's a place for people to meet and it's a place for people to meet and understand people that might be different from them so <clears throat> just back to to the lived experience and you know centering work our work around public life it's really about making people visible giving them a voice and we do that through data collection and storytelling. Um, and as I said, you know, various kinds of, of, of data collection from, from thick data, uh, being out there talking to people, recording what people think, feel, uh, observe, to big data where we, you know, we use different types of big data. It can be Google air quality data sets. Um, we, we use other third party data suppliers that, that gives us you know, quantitative data about people's like movement patterns in cities and so forth. And then we combine that with our own observational studies, um, which we most of the time conduct with, um, with partners, with volunteers, with, uh, with the public in the different cities that we work. And just like a quick pause on, you know, what does it mean to do storytelling? Um, from data, you know, when we collect data, we have we have data sets, we have graphs, but that's not necessarily telling everybody a story about what is, what does this data actually tell us. So one of our finest roles is not to collect the data, but to actually translate the data into stories that are engaging and can lead to lead to consensus building, lead to change. Um, so. Collecting data is, is sort of one piece of the puzzle and then actually analyzing that data and telling meaningful, meaningful stories with it is really what, what creates the impact and, and what we see becomes the, the game changer, so to speak, in, in decision-making around design and, and strategies in cities. So before I go into um, talking a little bit about what we did in Vancouver, um should we just 
I, I'm going to just look to Zach and see if he wants to do a pause or he wants me to to continue and go through the projects that I that I'm going to share. You can continue go through and I think you can keep the questions for Dan if you're good with that. Okay, sounds good. So uh, it was actually a welcome uh, request uh, from Mari to share a little bit about the Vancouver Places for People downtown work that we did because it also meant that I needed to revisit the work. It's been a couple of years um, and this was really one of the, you know, big first like really, really big scopes of work that I took on as a project manager after I moved to San Francisco. And um, it's work that I'm incredibly proud of. And um, needless to say that, you know, this is not work that, that Gail did on their own. This involved um, a lot of effort from a lot of different people. Um, and uh, both volunteers and and obviously you know the the city of Vancouver, who not only is you know, the client but also really the project leaders, we just played um, we just played a small role for a brief moment of, of in time in this bigger um, places for people initiative that is led by the city. So, one of the <clears throat> When we started out with this scope of work, it was, you know, um, our our scope of the work for the Places for People downtown program was really to understand how people use the public realm in downtown <clears throat> and what the public life profile of, of downtown across the downtown was broken into different, um, you know, areas across downtown. And then also, you know, to look at where might there be opportunities to further enhance that um, and basically, you know, enhance the public life profile and what might be some physical, spatial um, solutions that, that could, could help that. So at the outset, we really set out to create a plan for this grand public life study that we, we planned with the planning department in the city of Vancouver. And this is actually the biggest public life study that Gail has ever done. We had um, almost 300 volunteers out across the downtown of Vancouver, collecting public life observational data across um, streets, public spaces, both plazas and parks and, and, the, um, and along the coast. And, um, and uh, you know, this was a really, really big effort, but it also gave us a lot of high quality data that helped inform um, a series of, of strategies and, and, and you know, um, recommendations and goals that the city has then since taken, taken uh, further and, and developed their um, plan for the places for people downtown with, with input from, from us. So, the premise uh, project was was really, you know, that, you know, looking at the public realm of downtown and looking at how fast the city was growing, we're, we're talking 2016 at the time, it was really clear that for, um, you know, Vancouver to continue to thrive, uh, the public realm was going to have to, you know, work a lot harder with a lot more new residents coming into downtown and also increase in jobs. And now I admittedly don't know how impacted that has been by COVID, but this was, you know, the project premise at, at the time. And already at the time, it was very clear that the public spaces that were popular um, within the downtown were working very hard to accommodate all the people that, you know, use them. Um, but it was also very clear that there was untapped potential. There was some spaces that were less visited and um, when we started looking at where people moved and where people stopped and stayed, it was very clear that there was a lot of untapped potential in the street network of, of the city. And at the time, the city of Vancouver had already been working on pilot projects for, uh, for a series of, of, of years. And um, amongst that, Jim Diva Plaza, which was you know, a partial street, uh, street closure of a block there. So, so a lot of a lot of things were already in the works in the city. Um, 
but this scope of this work um, and the data collection really helped put the need for further work with that on the map. So as I said, we, we did a big data collection effort and, and in addition to the observational studies, which was conducted by this amazing group of volunteers, um, some of the volunteers also helped us collect um, intercept survey data and, and were out and about interviewing people out in the city, um, both uh, during a summer survey and a winter survey where we actually had to, at the time we were still using paper surveys. We have now since developed a, an app. So we actually collect data with, with an app. But back then um, we're still using paper and the winter survey, we actually spent time on figuring out, you know, could we actually afford, um, could the city actually afford to use uh, to 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 print all these surveys on paper um, where you know that was rainproof and where the ink wouldn't get smushed when it was raining because Vancouver is a rainy winter city and um, yeah so that was one of the small challenges that we had there but that was resolved and we collected a lot of of, of useful data and you know we we did the summer survey and it was really clear that that was very valuable and the city has a lot of it's very thriving in the summer but reality also is that vancouver is is not you know um 30 degrees and sunny all year but a large part part of the year it, it actually is more rainy and maybe more gray so to really be truly be a livable city it needs to be that all year as well so we thought it we found it really important to also do the winter survey and the city in addition to that, also conducted a whole series of engagement um, touch points where they had pop up events out in the city. And some of you might have encountered those or even been part of the surveys that we did. Um, so just a few uh, data points or things we heard when we conducted the conducted the survey. So one of the things that we learned from the from the intercept survey was that, you know, um, People um, that spend time outside in downtown also interact with people that they did not plan to meet. And a lot of people also interacted with people that they hadn't seen before. And, and this was, this, this was in, an important data point for us because this shows that there's a lot of social value in public space in Vancouver and that it really does have a plays a, a, a role um, in the in the sort of democracy of the city and people meeting um, and socializing even with people that they otherwise might not do. So this was an, an important data point to sort of show the value of investing in high quality public space um, in the future. Um, and I'm just going to show a couple of different of, of data points we collected a lot of different stories and this the full report of the public life studies is is actually available on on the city's website if you're curious to see more um another thing that was very clear was that you know that the seasons really have an impact on on the public life profile that there's a lot more activity in the summer and there's a lot less activity in the winter, which is not surprising necessarily. But what we heard from the intercept surveys that we did was that people would really like to see more urban space typologies that supported winter activity. So things like more coverings and um, um, you know protection from the weather was something that was asked for when we did the intercept surveys. And one thing to note with this is that this 70% drop in activity is related to people stopping and staying. People like were actually still moving in the city. And that's a remarkable uh, data point to mention because even though um, it gets rainy in Vancouver in the winter, the pedestrian data actually is not as impacted by it as the stationary data is. So there's still people out, they're just not choosing to sit on a bench, so to speak. Um, so that's in our eyes, you know, untapped potential. Why not, you know, think about ways where the city can become more inviting for people also when it's raining to, to stop and stay. 
and essentially be more more sticky as we call it so we you know we looked at a as i said a lot of different um spaces across the city and that was based on you know a plan um where we we looked at development plans for the city and you know what are the the main streets what are the main connections to the seawall what are the main parks today and what are places that could potentially become new um, quality public spaces in the downtown, including some of the, the private owned public spaces, and really looked at it as a network. And with that, also looking at where are there gaps in the network that would need to be further, you know, developed or explored for the network to be truly complete. So in our in our um, in our public life public space report, there are a series of mapping also mappings also showing you know, some of the missing links to, to the seawall, for instance, which is, was, you know, a big, big outcome of, of our work. Um, and, and this like sea to city um, work that's, that's happening right now might also actually be some version of an outcome of this process that happened some years ago now. So I'm really excited to learn more about that at some point. Um, but yeah, so, so, we, we, with the public life public space study, we developed a series of emerging uh, strategic directions to sort of set a framework for how to take some of these lessons learned from the survey into actual recommendations, goals, and, and outcomes that were tangible. And um, we, each of these emerging strategic directions has a series of goals and actions tied to them and some very high level, very conceptual ideas for where and what could actually happen um, to, to make those goals come to life um, across the downtown. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, this was really, you know, one part of, of the, places for people work that the city conducted and our scope was really to 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 center the public life experience around the the quality of the public spaces downtown and then the city took our work and recommendations and developed their downtown public space strategy which was was approved by unanimous council in 2020 and some of you might have might have seen that so that report holds components of what what we developed a lot, um, you know, in collaboration with the with the city, but it also holds pieces that was developed solely by by the city. And I think this is this is important to bring up. Like as a consultancy, you know, we we work with a lot of different cities, and and I think you know it was very successful in Vancouver for the reason that. There was resources and staff at the city that that really led the project, um, and um, and has has like you know worked on it for years. Um, we were just, as I said, there for a brief moment in time, over a year and a half, two years, um, and then you know Mari asked um, if I could share a little bit about how you know work work has changed since since COVID hit and I thought that was like an interesting premise so I want to share like really briefly before we go into Q&A a little bit about this project that um, I've been working on in in Mountain View here in California just south of, south of San Francisco for the last couple of years and um, it it was uh, it started as a um, sorry let me just backtrack um, we, we essentially worked on one, on a COVID-19 reopening um, pilot project with the city of Mountain View. Castro Street is Mountain View's downtown main street. And when COVID hit, that street got hit really hard economically. And um, the whole downtown, downtown lost, you know, um, most of its, its vibrancy. Um, they didn't see any commuters really come in anymore. They have four, four big employers that are mostly you know tech and biotech and with everyone working from home all of a sudden their downtown was pretty empty so 
So they engaged us to work with them on a strategy for a, a reopening pilot um, called Castro Summer Streets. Um, and pausing for a second, um, one thing I think is really interesting with this project is that it really cemented this, this statement for me that, you know, the only constant is change and it's a constant that people don't like change because we actually started out this project with the city um, as a feasibility study pre-COVID of whether it would be feasible to actually close one block of this downtown Main Street. And we were scoped to do a one year study with a lot of engagement and outreach with business owners and the public to understand everyone's, you know, needs and desires related to a potential street closure. This wasn't even a design scope. It was it was a feasibility study to to learn and understand whether, you know, it would break the system if they closed this one block of the street. And then, you know, just to situate, this is what the street looks like. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful tree, um, canopied, uh, human scale street with, you know, um, small scale buildings, a, a beautiful, like a nice rhythm of a lot of different types of, of uh, retail uh, in small buildings. But also, um, you know, a road <laughs> with a lot of cars going through. So it's it's sort of split in two by this this artery that runs um, in between the two very active and very packed sidewalks with a lot of activity. So so that's we we essentially started out trying to figure out whether you know we could get cars out of the street. Um, and then when COVID hit and it was clear that, you know, the businesses were really suffering because they, the amount of outdoor serving space that they had was really limited. The city asked us to rescope our scope and help them look at, you know, closing four blocks, not just one, as a, as a, as a business reopening or like um, a economic recovery strategy for the downtown. So we, you know, essentially in a course of a month, put together a plan for the closure, a concept for the closure. Um, the city staff did engagement with all the business owners to understand um, if this was something they wanted, everyone really wanted it. And there was uh, a traffic engineer that was scoped to work with us on the feasibility study that did some quick assessments of, you know, how do we close the street the best way? And do we need to close more than just, you know, the blocks? Um, and then we ended up with a plan where we closed four blocks, but not the cross streets. Um, so basically, you know, going from, you know, debating whether it would be possible to potentially close one block to closing four blocks and, you know, really having to think quickly about, okay, how do we do this quick, cheap, efficiently? We have to get it done now. We only have, you know, two days to implement. How do we do that? So very, very practically, like looking at, you know, paint samples and types of paint, um, looking at, you know, what are, you know, chairs and tables that we can get, you know, within our price range, or within the city's price range, and what is stuff that's in storage, what is stuff that the business owners already have, and what is stuff that we might be able to borrow from, from you know, some of these companies that are now working from home. And um, sort of had to do like a very quick assessment assessment of how much can we use that's already in store and how much do we actually need to go out and buy. And then we worked also with them to create signage and info because of the social distancing requirements with COVID reopening. Um, and then, you know, the very low practical stuff, like how do we avoid that cars actually end up driving into this closed street that is now going to be for outdoor serving and people people walking and also you know we need to make sure that there's places that people can go to the bathroom that they can wash their hands and that they can you know um sanitize and and also you know very low low practical bins and everything and um we did a, a layout for basically with a very high level concept of through zone and stay zone and everything, you know, mapped out with um, 
social distancing in mind, with ADA in mind, and with um, maximizing seating areas as much as possible in mind, because the business owners, of course, want as much as they could get. And it went from being this, you know, very high level study to this very, very practical, like mapping out six, six feet increments of space and, and maximizing that as much as possible. Uh, for seating areas and walkways, we designed, uh, you know, like an identity for the closure that was supposed to be just before the summer, because that was the hope, right, that COVID would only be, be there for a short while. And also design surveys to understand, you know, is this responding to what people need? Are there things that needs to be adapted? Um, and, and also to, to inform people about um, social distancing conduct when they came to the space. We, we designed some stencils and then, you know, we rolled up our sleeves, <laughs> literally, with city staff. We were out there for um, one full day um, painting, uh, putting out road tape to mark uh, the walking spaces, marking with stencils. And then literally within a couple of days had tables and chairs out and the businesses were back in business, literally. Um, this is what it what it looked like when it first when it first opened, and this has been very very successful. They've extended the time frame for it three times already, and now going back to you know the fact that this started out as a project that was approved by council to understand whether we could close one block. Um, this pilot, um, which is essentially you know it was a COVID pilot, but also a street closure pilot. Um, you know, show people that the system was not going to break. And not only did it show them that the system was not going to break if they closed one, one block, but that more blocks could be closed. So instead of the city posing the question, should we close one or more blocks? It became a demand from the public and from the business owners that it should really not just be one block, but it should be three blocks that would become permanently closed for traffic in the future. So the pilot really helped, you know, um, sort of ease people into the idea of, of change uh, because, it, it, you know, it, it happened and they engaged with it and they, they felt it and could see that, that this is really something that they wanted. So we went back and like sort of looked at, okay, what could the a permanent layout then look like and what are some of the lessons that we've learned from the temporary closure that we need to consider for a permanent closure, such as, you know, conflicts between people walking and people biking or people on scooters and so forth. So we developed three very high level conceptual alternatives for right of way um, redistribution with a with an actual closure and and took that out to the business owners and to the general public for voting. And within these three alternatives, we did have one that still allowed for some traffic, like one-way traffic. And that one, as I don't know if you can see my cursor moving here, but one to five was the ranking and five was not interested <laughs> in this concept. And one was like, let's do this one. So it was very clear to us that, that people really wanted the street closure and the COVID pilot really helped help mandate uh, you know, um, a permanent uh, closure of, of three blocks, not one block of this street. And now we're in a position where people are really saying, look, this is an essential destination in the city. It's unique. It really needs to show the best of Mountain View. And actually, with that, we think that you know, someone needs to um, set up some design guidelines for the interim closure because it's starting to look a little bit messy out there. So I actually just today started a new scope of work with the city of Mountain View to help them formulate a set of design guidelines for a three-year interim closure until they get the, you know, permanent redesign um, scoped in RFP, go through the design process, approval of budget, and can actually implement a permanent closure. This is what it looks like currently out there um, at night. There's a lot of different furniture, a lot of different, you know, umbrellas and canopies and 
whatnot. It looks a little bit messy, but it works really well. Um, there's not a lot of people here because this is actually taken when the, you know, after the restaurants closed. Um, but it's it's incredibly successful and um, you know, needless to say, the, the businesses are really, really happy about, you know, being able to operate through COVID and see the value of of the street being something else than a than than a, a place for cars to, to sit through. So with that, you know, closing statement, basically, you know, investing in people first can lead to impact and impactful and meaningful change. And I'm gonna stop there. And I think we still have a little bit of time for some Q and A, Zach. Wow, that was so insightful. It was so interesting and insightful. Thank you so much for that. Um, I have a couple of questions of my own, but I'm just going to ask if anybody has questions to put them in the chat and then I'll start with my own and then is by it, the time that people write them down. It, should we stop yeah. screen share and like look at some faces yeah. So what do you, what do you, how do you want to do this? Uh, you can stop screen sharing if you want and we can just like, it can be both of us. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then if people want to put questions in the chat, I'll like ask them after all. After. Yeah. So my first question is that Gal does so many projects with different communities. Um, kind of like, how do you maintain a respectful and co-learning approach while working with like so many different communities? And I think like the second part of that question is how do you develop like a site-specific approach? Because they're working all over the world, like in yeah. basically every single continent, Gal has a project, you know? So how, wh what do you think is your approach toward that? Yeah, that's a really good question. So. Number one is that we never work alone. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's like, you know, the, the main thing when we do community engagement, when we, we know that we need to work with local trusted partners to do meaningful engagement. And obviously there's like different kinds of engagement, there's different levels of data collection. And we, there's a lot of things that we can do on our own, but there's also a lot of things that we can't do on our own. And I think like when we start to get into like, you know, places where there are, or like areas where there is, you know, displacement or like questions about, you know, equity, equitable distribution of funds and things like that, we really, you know, need local partners that can be the link and be the trusted, um, you know, link between us and the local communities that, you know, might already feel like they're not seen or heard and, and are they really going to be that by this consultant that comes from the outside. Then on the other hand, sometimes, you know, I've also experienced that, that these communities actually really appreciate someone coming from the outside that are willing to listen and hear their part of the story because they might not trust the local, um, yeah. you know, um, entities that have been doing work there before. So it's always an assessment. Yeah. And, you know, while we have a lot of tools in our library and a lot of ways that we kind of do things and tend to do things, you know, an intercept survey is always something that needs to be um, shaped specifically for the goal of the project and for the community we're in. And the same with observational studies. Like we always, you know, spend a lot of time up front in a project, understanding like how we actually get a successful outcome. Yeah, you know, I think like something I find so interesting about Gal is how much of it is research-based, which is something that you mentioned at the beginning. Like so much of it is like research and analysis and surveys and going out on the field and talking to people and how to interact with that. Something I think is like, is that how do you maintain a level of humanity to your like your subjects not subjects but the people yeah. out there will also like accumulate that data and using it for your design like how because it kind of like, it could plot in people you know yeah and you know it's not always always obvious you know like in in Mountain View it was very obvious like 98 percent of respondents wanted a street closure or like 99 percent it's like that's that's obvious not sometimes it's really fuzzy and that then it requires more like, you know, a delicate approach to like managing like, well, this is what we heard from this and, and always like constantly like matching that up against, you know, the city's vision, um, funding available and like, it's, it's always a balancing act, right? Because yeah. there's a lot of different 
you know, um, evaluation criteria essentially that needs to lead to where, you know, what ends up being the actual product that comes out of the process, especially if there's an implementation component. Yeah, totally. Um, somebody asked in the chat if there, is there any way to look at the app and sixes of data that you did for the Vancouver project other than once posted on the Vancouver website? Yeah, I mean, we, we did put together a, an appendix just of the public life data that we collected. I don't mm -hmm. think it, it contains the intercept survey data, like the raw data. Um, but I can go back and look for that. I would just need to check with the with the client that it's okay to share it, but I can't mm -hmm. I can't see like why it shouldn't be. Um, mm -hmm. And then I I can maybe I can share it through you. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and then another question that we have in the chat is, how do you relate the theories and principles established by Gail during the earlier times to kinetic and every changing facets of today? Yeah. Yeah. That is, that's a really, really good question. So, you know, even when I've been with the company for 12 years, so, so even just between when I started and now, and like the breadth of like different types of data that we collect and how we approach our projects has just changed quite dramatically while still maintaining the, the sort of OG DNA, so to speak, about, you know, it being about human scale people first. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, we've had a multiple sort of, um, you know, stop and think moments throughout the company's time where it's like, okay, we, we really need to, to like reevaluate some of our survey methods. We really need to bring new types of questions and new types of like things that we do through our survey that we observe through our studies to the table, because where there's like goals that we can't hit or recommendations we can't do with the type of data we collect that are necessary in this day and age. So things related to like um, equity, race, ethnicity, and, and then just as an example, some, some things related to climate change. There's a lot of different things that, you know, weren't really part of the original data collection tools that we've since then, you know, added new ways of, of looking at, you know, how do we develop equitable, healthy cities? How do we develop more sustainable green cities? And, and both developed or like further developed on our own survey methods, but also, as I mentioned earlier, like we, we use a lot more third party data too. And that's one of the things that's changed dramatically over just the last five years what's available out there like mm -hmm. both open source data but also like companies that are set up to collect you know data about like use patterns and price points and like air quality and all these different kinds of data and some of it you know we we, we go into partnerships and we, we or we pay for the data or pay to use like a platform or some that's been developed by another company but but sometimes we also find that there's a gap and that we need to actually develop our own you know our own tools mm -hmm. internally so one of the newer tools that we developed is like an amenity map tool that's based on like the gale quality criteria where we can map you know amenities across like a whole city or a neighborhood and then pair that with where we see public life and then you know basically very specifically say something about like certain types of amenity draws more people um to a place yeah. so we're constantly developing our methods and and once in a while we also have to stop and say like is this still ethically correct the way the correct way to do what we do um and you know we observe age and gender of people is that even okay you know there's always this these things come up all the time and, and we have to reevaluate and, and adapt our methods. Yeah, I know. I think like moving on to the question of equity, a yeah. question I find really interesting is like when we're talking about public space and like urban design, it's in, there's a long history of placing marginalized communities. So kind of like how does Yale work with that? And then also there's another question to chat, I think kind of like works with that is how do you answer that the voices and lived experiences of marginalized groups are represented represented in your survey methods? Yeah, so that's that's a really, really good question. And 
you know, the observational studies are kind of one thing. They, they're in a way quite pragmatic because it's like, what do you see out there, right? But they, there's a lot that they don't tell us. So, you know, right, right now we're, we're working, just an example, we're working on a scope of work with, with Novo Nordisk cities changing, cities changing diabetes, and it's about food access. Um, and access to healthy food. And in that we work with a lot of underserved communities and really have had to develop other ways of asking people questions and engaging with them, both because resources are different, people's time is different. Um, but we also need to like build, we need to work harder on building meaningful relationships with, with community members, right? So one of the tools we developed was, you know, a, a very simple, um like a uh, day book where multiple community members like we worked in a couple of different cities one of them was philadelphia we we gave this tool to a series of people living in the community that we're looking at and they logged you know their days and like made notes and so we have really really rich big uh, thick data from that that comes straight from people but it didn't require that they showed up at a certain place at a certain time or engaged directly with us. They, they could really do it within their own space. Um, and so we, you know, we spend a, normally we spend a lot of time on like meeting people where they are being on ground, but with COVID we've had to like really rethink that. And we worked in a lot more digital tools and more tools where we basically use um, data collection that are done by people to solicit their input and 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 their um, uh, not just input but also their opinions, mm -hmm. and then use that to formulate our recommendations. Um, does that? Wow. Yeah, that, that makes answer? a lot of sense. Yeah, that answers yeah. the question. I think like just a smaller little question based on that that I'm interested in is like you collect so much data, like so much fake data as you describe it. How does how much time does it take you guys to disseminate everything and like kind of distill and like get what yeah. you need out of it? I'm, uh, that's a, that's a good question. And I'm very happy to say that we have our <laughs> own like data team yeah. now in house. So when like just a few years ago, we didn't have that. So we didn't have a, a digital app to collect our public life data, but we do now we have a whole like team that's set up to help with like streamlining our data collection and, and data analysis efforts. So when we did the big survey up in Vancouver, everything was done on paper. The city spent weeks on entering the data, which is not very resource efficient. So we really was like, this, this cannot happen again. So we need to find another way to do that. So we have an in-house staff that helps with that. And then again, just as with you know, more data being available, there's also more savvy like tools out there to help um, analyze quick quickly like both thick and big data sets so we use mm -hmm. tools like tableau which is you know a software um developed by a software company and we we've used urban footprint which also has data in it and where you can add your own data too there's a lot of different ways the thick data and sort of like the recorded data usually requires a little bit more manpower, even if we can systematize it and run it through our machine, we still spend more time on actually looking through the nuances, but, but we have like coding that can do like word searching and like really quickly sort of, you know, give us an yeah. overview was like, what are the key hitters? What is it positive? Is it negative? And then we basically use that to get an overview. And then we do a deeper dive more like ask people does that make sense like, yeah yeah and like machine power for the big stuff like yeah. manpower for the thick stuff <laughs> yeah, yeah um and i think our last question is do you mind just talking a little bit more about the importance of creating story out of data yeah absolutely yeah. so you know we've learned over that like over you know the company's history and and even before that then when you can very simplistically tell a story and back it up with numbers, then you know you can get buy-in from also both from the also from the people that needs to make the final decisions and also you know the final decisions on investments. So when we collect when we collect data, we look 
in the data we look for like meaningful stories that can push like have a push on like and actually create impact um and then distill them down to like the most simple way of 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 like delivering that message so it's almost like back end and fund in if you want to talk like yeah. computer right um <laughs> and um and you know um it's just sort of by it's come through like doing by doing and seeing it being impactful over the years and leading to change over the years um, from very simple things like early earlier projects that were just like pointing out that you have more people walking than you have sidewalk with to accommodate that needs to change if you want to you know actually yeah, yeah. Get to the activity that you have in your city to more complex stories about like okay we're looking at the big data set and we see that if you very you know high level look at it there is actually food access and food security in this neighborhood but then when you start looking at the thick data people are not you know people don't have access to the type of food that you know is relevant for their cultural backgrounds or the supermarket that looks like it's right next to the neighborhood is actually on the other side of the freeway which means you, they can't get there so it's like really really like thinking about yeah there is information in the big data but to really understand how it impacts people's every day, you need to combine it with like at street experience and thick data. Um, so I'm getting lost in my answer here a little bit, but <laughs> um, just bringing it back to um, your, your initial question about data and storytelling. Um, the, the, if, if I were to sort of like break down, if I do a design project, let's say I have a project that's about, you know, redesign of a street, and that's technically the outcome of the project we need to get to. Um, sort of percentage wise, we probably spend about 50 to 60% of our work time and scope on building the case for it through data collection and storytelling. We use that for outreach. So you know, you can't expect everyone to be able to decipher complex data sets. So it's really our job to say like, this is the key stories that we see in this data. And then we take it out to people and say, does this resonate with you? Did we miss something? And, you know, we can collect data from here to eternity. That doesn't mean that we'll cover everything. So we also use engagement as a checks and balances on, on the data stories that we develop with the data that we collect. And sometimes it also tells us that we actually need to go and do more research um, that that we missed, we missed the mark on some things. But but the, the simple narrative has shown to be very impactful over the years. So sometimes we might have, you know, you know, like, let's just say 100 data stories about a place and why, you know, building the case for why it should change, but it's one data point that really becomes what everyone fixates mm -hmm. on and what changes the game. And it's oftentimes the most simple data point that becomes <laughs> the, the lever that, that, or the, you know, the weight that, that shifts. Yeah. Wow, that was so interesting. Thank you so much for the answers. Thank you so much for the lectures. I wish we were like in a real place we could hear everybody clap right now, but just my little clap. Like cheers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Friday um, night. <laughs> thank you so much for to Sala, the School of Architecture, Landscape Architecture for hosting this. And thank you for everybody for coming and watching tonight. It was so wonderful having you, Sophie. And thank you for the wonderful work that you do. Thank you for having me. I was really honored to be asked to be a part of this series. I wish I could have come to the school. Um, and if there is, is any other like point of connection that comes up, do feel free to reach out. I will check in on the data sets from Vancouver and get back to you on that. And then just encourage everyone if they're curious about, you know, understanding more the breadth of like type of analysis and like data collection we do and and how we use that for storytelling we have an issue page that has a lot of reports on it and you can basically just go and and sift through and and if anyone has like specific questions for me you can you can send them to me through sac, sac or, or amari yeah great thank you so much have a great night everybody have a great evening
Thanks for having me. Have a good night, everyone.